there is a kind of a paradox I would suggest that attends the what we might call it the genocide in Gaza the war in Gaza of course the war in Palestine um, and that is um, it is a war that has shocked like few conflicts in recent memory um, the images that we have seen day from day are unbearable and we may surmise that it is precisely because these are images that one cannot bear look at that if you one were to um, follow the Swedish papers these days uh, one struggles to actually find news about Palestine at all one needs to scroll down usually uh, to the bottom of the pages and Svenska Dablod and Dagen Snihete. And in that regard, the papers in Sweden, the media in Sweden um, is uh, also, according to uh, researchers that I've talked to, quite peculiar. They're really trying to avoid um, looking at these images and, and they're trying to avoid uh, Swedes, Swede, uh, Swedish publics looking at these images. Um, if we were to Look up the uh, Svenska Dagbladet's um, headlines from yesterday. Um, you would not know that South Africa has presently filed, of course, uh, a petition to the International Court of Justice to issue a, um, I don't know the legal term is, but uh, to issue a, a, an order um, to prevent genocide in Palestine. Um, what you would read are stories about Israelis still living the trauma of October 7. But I and I and I think, but I think there's something else if one were to look at this, look at the coverage of of the war right now, there there is a way in which it has receded, let's say, in the um it has receded from, let's say, its urgency seems to have dimmed somewhat. If you one were to look also beyond the Swedish papers. Um, indeed, I think, and I think this is what is painful for me and for many of us, there is a sense in which the war has been routinized, in which 150, 200, 300 people dying every day has barely become, is barely news by now. Uh, and in this regard, and that's so, sort of why I'm here today uh, talking, the, the, the genocide in, in Palestine, the war in Palestine, is also of a certain, uh, it, it, it reflects a sort of a broader, um, uh, a broader trend, let's say, a broader phenomenon that we observe uh, in, um, in the coverage of conflicts and how we relate uh, as publics, as audiences in Europe to uh, 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 conflicts elsewhere, right? Um, and I think it's it should be taken. It's, it should be noted that even the war that the Sme Swedish media would now like Swedish audiences to refocus on, right? Um, the war that matters, that we care about, uh, or at least should care about, the U war in the Ukraine, the war in which white people are dying, right? in which we could be next in a very particular understanding of we, that war too, I think, has been routinized. If we think about what, how we now relate to the Ukrainian war in Sweden, it's receded, it's happening out there, it's become part of, of the everyday in a certain sense. And so, uh, however much they try, right, you see the papers really struggling here to, uh, uh, to sustain a sort of an engagement and investment in um, the tragedy in uh, Ukraine. And of course, it is a tragedy as well. And um, and this problem of relating to the to the pain of others is what I wanted to talk to talk about today. Um, it is, in a broad sense, um, the topic of this by now classic book by Susan Sontag, um, one of I think certainly America's foremost public intellectuals, and America is a country that has not had many public intellectuals. Um, a polymath writer, uh, literary essayist, uh, and thinker. Um, Sontag, I think, is perhaps best known, at least originally, for her uh, reflections on uh, on photography, on the medium of photography. 
Um, and, and this book regarding the pain of others is very much about regarding the pain. In other words, in the English sense of looking at uh, the pain. And she it's a discussion among other things about images. Um, and the question that she asks in this work is why is it that we care about what happens to others or as commonly that we do not care? Um, and it's the question that I want to discuss with you that I want to discuss here with Stockholm, um, with um, Stockholm Academics for Palestine, um, because what you have been doing over the past three months is also evidence and illustration of the fact that this descent into indifference is not inevitable, right? That, that you are sustaining an engagement, right? And perhaps even intensifying it. Although, of course, I'm also interested to hear about the challenges that you yourself feel in, in doing that. Um, and I hope that's, that's what I would like to talk to about at the end of this lecture. Um, you are proof that there are people who continue not merely to care about others, but also to mobilize on behalf of others, uh, with others. Um, and one of the, the sort of the central question that I would propose to explore with, to the, with you today is precisely the, is precisely how we can understand the relationship between feeling and doing, right? How they are related. Um, and I, in, 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 um, that discussion, I'd like to draw on a concept originally introduced by uh, a Jewish uh, philosopher Baruch Spinoza, uh, a notion that he called affect, uh, which he uh, defined as the capacity to affect and be affected. It's the most succinct formulation. Uh, it's a notion that's become a very important concept in the discipline of anthropology, my discipline, Victor's discipline. Uh, and cognate disciplines across the humanities, um, in large part because um, uh, prominent uh, thinkers, uh, thinkers who are important to us, such as uh, French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, um, uh, have uh, have reappropriated and worked with Spinoza's concept of affect, um, and sort of uh, disseminated that concept to a, a larger intellectual readership. Um, and I'd like to, in this lecture, think and read Sontag's classic text, it's a key paragraph from it, with the help of this notion of affect, um, and to go from there to try to think with you and ask you then finally about your own feelings and what you uh, are both able to feel and do uh, in this moment. Um, and now, one of the sort of, one of the most commonplace and intuitive ways of thinking about how we are affected by images of conflict, by images of war, Right, um, and the sort of the common sense that Susan Sontag sets out to question, right, to challenge, um, is that we are moved by images. If an image is horrifying enough, we assume we will respond to it. Um, and here we, of course, we see how this does not actually accord with our lived experience, right? In the sense that with time, we know that we can become inured to the pain of others, right? Uh, we may even feel guilty about it because we think we should feel and yet we don't feel. And this bad, this feeling bad about not feeling is, of course, of itself also a form of feeling, as Sontag indeed points out. And the common, I would propose... Uh, the common, the most commonplace way in which we talk about this is we say something to the effect of there are simply too many images to respond to, too many conflicts out there. Um, we are inundated. We don't know what to do about them. Um, and it's also by this logic, of course, that the Swedish media understands that Palestine is a distraction from the real war, the war that matters, right? Ukraine, um, because there can only be so much attention in its understanding. The Sontag has a slightly, oh, this is a picture of some very beautiful people uh, uh, protesting. This is a, Sontag has a, a different, um, a sort of a, a different way of thinking about this question, uh, about of, of, how, of why it is that we struggle to feel. And the key text that I'd, uh, focus in on here is the, the bolded one in the bottom. And what she says is that people don't become inured to what they are shown, 
that's the right way to describe what happens because of the quantity of images dumped on them. She doesn't agree with this. She, they become inured. It is passivity that dulls feeling, she says, right? What does she mean by this? Well, I would argue that what she tells us um, is that we have gotten the order of things wrong in a certain sense. And that's where the notion of affect comes in. Um, I think that what she's saying, and I'll try to explain how, is that it's not that we don't act because we don't feel, it's that we don't feel because we don't act, because we are passive. Or to put it in Spinoza's terms, that we are not affected because we don't affect, right? We don't do something. How, 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 how does this make sense? Uh, one way to try to understand this is by ways of an American uh, pragmatist philosopher from the pragmatist school of philosophy named William James. Um, uh, who is was a psychologist and um, spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to, what it means, what do we mean when we say that we act on something, right? Uh, and the underlying sort of uh, insight of James, what he sort of tries to lift forward is that when we react to what happens. We don't re only react to what happens now, we also re re react to everything that has happened in the past. In other words, we see a hot flame and we shy away from it because we have already been burnt at some point in the past, right? It is never merely the thing that happens now, it is also our own bodily memory of that, right? Um, and in James's argument, um, in any kind of response to what happens, right, we, are, we solicit this kind of a repertoire of of responses to what's happened, which is part of our bodily memory, right? And so if there is a hot flame, we have in our bodily memory, memory to uh, uh, recoil from it, right? And here is, uh, and, and the, the underlying point of this is that uh, affect, the capacity to, the, to affect and to be affected is part of a feedback loop. It needs to be understood as part of your conditioning over uh, a long period of time, in other words, right? So you affect and you are affected and so forth and, and so forth, right? Um, and the question then arises, and that is where we, uh, I think, uh, arrive at eventually, ultimately, in the sort of uh, 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 modern mediatized world, is that, um, well, what happens then if we um, are not used to responding to a particular kind of image? If we don't understand ourselves to have the capacity to act on suffering, pain, injustice that we see. Um, well, if we don't have um, the capacity, if we don't have it in our memory, in our, in our experience to react to it, right, um, then we effectively stop feeling in relation to it, right? It becomes, let's say, uh, unimportant. There's even a way of understanding it um, is, as becoming meaningless. Um, for James, the pragmatist tradition of James, but also thinkers like philosophers like Heidegger, the meaning of something, it's a very peculiar way of thinking about it, but I think it's a, it's a very helpful one, is what you can do with it. The meaning of a hammer is what you know to do with a hammer, right? And that meaning can also evolve, right? And over time, because you learn to do different things with a hammer and so forth, right? In that sense, meaning always expands. Um, but what we then take from this, sort of um, a way of understanding our capacity to affect and be affected, right? Is that our, um, our emotionality, what we're able to feel is conditioned by our, our activity, what, what, we are, what we are in the habit of doing, right? If you are, for instance, then such a person who perhaps goes on marches, engages with people, right? You're more likely to feel not merely your own pain, the pain that you have made your own, but also the pain of others in a certain way. You're going to have a, a capacity to relate to others in another kind of way. Um, and one of the important points of one of the reasons for why it's really interesting to think with affect for academics such as myself is that, it, is that we have here a way of thinking about relationality that is not is a little bit different 
from the notion of identification that we typically work with in a common sense intuitive way, right? We usually, we're used to thinking of ourselves as having identities and of think in thinking about our capacity to relate to each other, right? On the basis of those identities, right? So there are particular issues that particular subsections of a population are concerned about, right? If you're property owners, then that's your subject position and you are concerned about taxes, right? If you are uh, 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 a queer person, you are concerned about a certain kind of legal framework around the question of your rights to marriage and so forth, right? And that's, and, and your, your politics is then understood to be a function of those, those subject positions. Um, and what I, and what I, what is interesting to have with affect to me is that it allows us to think about a different way of relating uh, to each other. It is not a feeling built, this is not a feeling of relationality, right, yeah. built on being the same already as someone else. Rather, it is a feeling that allows you to look for the ways in which you are the same, to actively construct that, right? It becomes a kind of a work in progress. Um, that is how I understand, um, in my own reading, um, the uh, the sort of the notion of intersectionality that is um, originally uh, coined and then developed by um, this group of, uh, of the feminist, black feminist collective known as the Combahee River, River Collective, writing in the late 1970s and 80s. Um, are you, you, I think a number of you will be familiar with this notion of an intersectionality, yeah? Um, basically an understanding being that we need to understand each other mere as more, more than as merely one identity, right? That we are multiple overlapping identity. And that becomes a resource, resource, right? That affords a grounds for a common politics, right? But it's my contention that these identities are actually no, never there always already, that they actually have, that they are, con that they are found by the people who engage in uh, action together, right? And in that sense, action, the, the act of, of doing things together is actually the condition of possibilities, the necessary part of allowing you to understand yourself as sharing, as moving together. Um, and it's that notion of movement, right, which I would counterpose to the notion of ourselves, which is counterintuitive, which is the common sense way of thinking about it as positions. Me being here in a particular coordinate, right? A subject position as we call it academically, right? And you being over here and the needing to find some sort of common ground. Rather, I would propose, right? That we think of it more as a kind of a dance, a movement together, right? In which we are all occupying, not only are we occupying a position, but we are potentially occupying the position over there. So I can, I can start to imagine myself literally being in your position because we're all moving, right? Uh, we're literally dancing with each other. Um, and I think, and this is what's what's also uh, quite interesting with affect as a concept is that because it is a concept that allows us to think actually beyond the distinction between metaphor and let's say substance, which is a very constituted part of modern thinking. It is a way of thinking with virtuality, with that which is neither metaphorical nor real, right? But in a kind of the, sort of the, the literal reality, right? So if we were to think about... Uh, dancing together right why is it that we know this scene uh, of Yemeni Houthis right who have seized this ship heading for Israel and what do they do on this ship they dance right why how do we make sense of this right this exuberance of movement right um how do we make sense of this right perhaps images you've also seen right um and what they speak to is precisely this uh, joining of two subject positions, right? The Palestinian and the Native American, right? Uh, as being, uh, 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 as uh, let's say, confronting, you know, the same sort of uh, settler colonial project, right? Uh, as participating in a movement together, a dance together, and and but I think that and and what's but what's what's important for me to st what's important for me is to not is is that we should is to understand that we should never take these sorts of similarities for granted they are never self-evident or self-made right and that is in fact why a lot of politics is not possible that, that's why a lot of people who we think should be in alliance in fact aren't right in different kinds of ways right so this is something that is the function of a kind of a uh always already a kind of in a capacity to move a capacity to be uh affected and to affect someone else to literally if you think about it pulling and pulling to dance with someone else right the movements of 
uh, of relation and the move the images of movement and relationality and movement as relation relationality and there's a kind of an inherent expansiveness to this right i think this is a sort of a dance that wants to expand uh, it's 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 a, it's one way to understand why it is that all revolutions are in fact contagious in some sense right i think the arab spring is perhaps the most striking example of that right um in modern history um here are images from uh, the political posters from a website called the Palestine Poster Project, which I uh, very much encourage you to browse through if you're interested. And they are posters that uh, uh, imagine the struggle of, of the Palestinian people as being with one with the struggle of the Irish people for independence, as being one with the struggle of the Vietnamese people, right, for freedom. Um, this particular image to the, the Irish one is... Uh, it's it's showing if you can see it, but it's showing uh, mothers of Palestinian political prisoners protesting after the death of Bobby Sands in, uh, in the hunger, famous hunger strike of the IRA in, in 1881. Right, people that I talk to in Palestine, particularly people who are involved in prison advocacy, everyone knows Bobby Sands. They talk about him as someone they all walked with, marched with. Right, this Irish prisoner on the other side of the world. And it's this instinctive empathy, a kind of openness. Um, that I something that's 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 very striking to me, and something that I think to observe among Palestinians, and I think to observe it, it struck me because it contrasts in a very stark way to, uh, it, it, to um, my experience in you in the U.S. in Europe, right? Um, so this is a picture of um, the wall in Bethlehem. Uh, it's a picture of George Floyd. Uh, the other. Uh, you know, images of him cropped up in Palestine uh, during the Black, Black Lives Matter movement. And I think this happened very spontaneously. There was a sense of here is someone that we identify with. We're going to, um, uh, he's he's part of us, right? And I think um, that if one understands this kind of, um, let's say this affective capacity, right, as being, uh, a, a necessary part of, of of a capacity to engage in politics. One can also come to understand then how others, uh, other movements, can in turn identify with the Palestinian movement. These are scenes from a, from a demonst demonstrations in Galicia, in uh, in Spain, where a friend of mine is doing a, a uh, doing research for a PhD thesis on um, uh, 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 nationalist uh, labor organizing, um, and Galicia one being one of the. Uh, the uh, regions of Spain in which there is a long-standing movement for autonomy, uh, uh, independence from Spain, right? Uh, and a history of imagining their own subjugation of Spain as being akin, uh, certainly in the 1970s, 60s, to the colonial subjugation of Morocco and North Africa, right, to, uh, to Spain. A quite striking, you know, sort of imaginary, Im imaginary association, right? So this is uh, the banner here. Uh, so my friend who's conducting this um, this research in Galicia, uh, she related to me that they invited a, a member of a Palestinian labor movement, uh, labor union, to come and talk to them shortly after October 7. Um, and he came and talked about uh, what had happened. And someone asked him, um, how do you understand, how do you relate to what happened on October 7th? In other words, the violent, the killing. And he said, in a very succinct way, he said, we are proud of our resistance, right? And that is a statement that it is fair to say impossible to make in, I think, most most sort of media spheres in Europe and certainly in Sweden, Sweden, right? Because October 7th is understood to have been a massacre, right? A massacre of civilians, right? Um, we know, of course, that it was, it, it most likely was a massacre, but it was not only that, right? It was also uh, a, a military battle between Palestinian guerrillas and uh, uh, Israeli soldiers encamped in about a dozen army bases surrounding um, the Gaza Strip, um, from which the Gaza Strip had been bombarded for 15 years, right? Um, and that for Palestinians, and certainly all of my friends, right, who in responding to it, this was not, this was, I think Palestinians don't take, don't, um, I don't think they believe 
the Israeli narrative October 7th, right? And you can be critical of that if you want or not, but you need you need to take seriously that they do not believe that these massacres actually happened or that they actually were responsible for it, right? And there are, uh, of course, a um, uh, lot has been written, if not, if not in, the, in the European media, about the fact that we know that a large number of Israelis were killed by the Israeli army itself when they retook um, um, uh, the uh, the kibbutzim that had been uh, occupied by um, these these Palestinian guerrillas, um, tanks and Apache helicopters strafed uh, uh, large areas because they couldn't distinguish between the Palestinian fighters and um, and the um, and Israelis, right? Um, but I but I I raise this example of of uh, of what of you know of this uh, of what this man said to them because their response to it was applause complete applause right to something that is simply unsayable in most parts of europe right um and i think whatever it is however it is that one might relate to what happened to october 7th and again i think one needs to take seriously that it it simply is not the same event for different kinds of constituencies and the battle is in certain senses how you understand what happened and what is responsible right but i raise this point because i think it is. It marks a crucial difference in the in the relationship of this of these Galician activists to the Palestinian struggle, um, and the relationship of the vast majority of European progressives in the north, particularly in Sweden, who have spoken out in some way in horror at what's happening in Gaza because they are horrified by the images of children dying and so forth. Right, but their identification or the relationship to Palestinians is as victims. Right. Right? They are crying over babies, right? Um, uh, and we know, um, and so, and and I think so. I think the point to be made, I think, is that it is only possible to have this sort of effective engagement with someone else, right? Insofar as you understand them also to be in movement, right? They are not an object in that sense, right? They're not a uh, 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 a target of your pity. Rather, they are something, someone in, in in relation to which you are becoming something else, right? In which you can see yourself undertaking a journey of sorts, in a certain sense, right? Um, um, we can other we can only be in movement uh, with with others if they are also themselves in movement, right? Um, I think that's one way in which we can understand why it is that the Palestinian cause has indeed resonated historically across the world with many different uh, uh, political movements and continues to do so today. It is not merely because Palestinians are uniquely oppressed uh, uh, because of course there are many conflicts around the world in which people suffer terribly, um, uh, but it has something to do among other things with the fact that Palestinians continue to struggle. Right? Um, I think also that's, how we might understand the sort of curious silence in the sort of that is there in the public debate or non-debate about October seventh in Europe, right? This language that accompanied the event, in which when it, it, that maintained that Israel has the right to defend itself, you know, a notion of something that we've talked about and that is in fact being questioned now also in the Swedish media by legal experts on legal grounds in the sense of international law does not provide the right of an occupier to defend themselves in that those terms against the people that they occupy. But there's a more fundamental, I think, underlying problem in that sort of debate debate or non-debate, right? It is the question that people throw back, right, at this question, which is, do Palestinians have the right to defend themselves, right? Uh, and we might ask ourselves, how would Dagens Nihet or Svenska Dagbladet respond to that? How would the Swedish government as spokesperson respond to if you put them on the spot, right? Um, my sense is that they really wouldn't know how to answer it, that in a certain sense, they might technically admit that, yes, in an abstract sense, everyone has the right to, de to defend themselves, but I really think they would struggle to admit that Palestinians have the right to use violence, right, in the defense of themselves, right, and and uh, and their cause in the manner that Israel, right, uh, is, has the right to use violence, right? They would be really uncomfortable. In fact, in my entire time following this conflict, right, which I followed for most of my adult life, and I'm happy to be corrected, you know, about this, but I've never heard a spokesperson for European Foreign Ministry affirm solemnly, right, in the manner that it is that that Israel's right to defend itself is constantly affirmed that the Palestinians have the right to defend themselves. 
even if this would then be a sort of a, an affirmation that is attended by a, a sort of a, an admonishment that it should be within the bounds of the law, that civilians should be targeted, the very notion of Palestinians using violence as such is not something that I think a Europe, European government can endorse, perhaps unless it is Ireland. I'm, I'm not sure, right? Um, uh, and I think that also reflects, I think, a broader historical observation. We may note that I think historically very few Europeans have been comfortable with brown men and women taking their own liberation in their own hands, right? Um, that's why we have films about Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a European hero standing up but trying to, you know, bring justice to the world, right? Um, that is why the Haitian Revolution of 1804 was such a uh, 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 an incredibly uh, um, uh, uh, problematic event for Europeans, right? Because, of course, on the one hand, it was a revolt by slaves, right, by the really the wretched of the earth, right? But at the same time, it also marked a challenge to the sense of who it is that has the right, right, to struggle in the modern world, right? Um, um, and I think there are other ways of thinking in, in which Afric helps us understand um, certain tropes in the ways in which... Um, uh, um, the colonial, the tropes, let's say, of the colonial imaginary historically, right? In that imaginary, uh, which is an imaginary of, of white European men, colonized peoples and women, including white European women, uh, are, are, are have, you know, traditionally historically been thought of as excitable, right? Easy to emotion, you know, not, you know, not rational in that sense. And that's, and that judgment is often uh, made by comparing them to children in one way or another, right? Um, and we might ask, perhaps in response to that, why is it a bad thing to be to be emotional as such? Why would it be a bad thing to be able to be affected by the world, to feel the pain of another? Is not that not an ethical way to relate to the world? I would say it's a good thing, um, but I would also, and I would say that departing from that understanding, there is something in that sort of classic colonial trope that I think is worth thinking through, um, if only as so as to come out on the other side, so to speak, of the sort of the 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 structure of prejudice that it that it um, uh, erects, right? Um, in my own understanding, having you know um, lived and worked in Palestine for many years, Palestinians very much have the capacity to affect and be affected, right? Um, this does not mean that, in a kind of a broad sense, that they are emotional, right? In the sense of crying often. To the contrary, right? I have can't remember. I can't count the number of interviews I've had with a with a bereaved mother or father, um, in which I've struggled to hold back the tears as they talk about an imprisoned uh, uh, or, or you know uh, a, a family member or someone who has died. Right? Um, I've marveled of always at this sort of stoicism of. Uh, of of men at a burial, right? And that's also why the images of Palestinians crying in Gaza are so extraordinarily um, uh, uh, painful, right? Because you understand that something has really broken down when uh, a Palestinian man cries in public, right? Um, um, in fact, one of the most touching scenes, I think, from that we have, that we may kind of a type of scene that we have that we have seen coming out of the, the imagery from Gaza, right, is of this sort of extraordinary love and care, right, offered, um, produced by doctors, ambulances, ambulance workers, right, uh, uh, taking in a child who has, whose family has been killed, reassuring them, right, uh, comforting them, you know, um, and, and if you listen to these videos, these are scenes in which, you know, the 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 person in question, you know that inside they are completely falling apart. But what they produce is this, is absolute calm for the sake of the child, right? To say, don't worry, it's over. The bombing is over. If you hear the tone of this of this of this nurse speaking, right, and you know that he's falling apart inside. Um, um, so this is um, a, 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 an ability to respond to the feeling of another, right, and to do something in response to that feeling. But it's not sentimentality, right? Um, um, it's a capacity to become a father and an uncle and a brother, right, to anyone around you, right? And in fact, it's one of the kind of interesting things if you, of an, a kind of a feature of, of colloquial Arabic usage is that there is a way in which one, speaking in Arabic, can relate to, can talk about oneself in the third person 
typically in the context of affectionate, loving relationships with, say, a niece or a nephew. So you would say something like, if in Swedish you would say, let's say I meet my nephew and uh, uh, over dinner, uh, let's say he's playing playing uh, uh, in the living room uh, during a visit, and I in Swedish I would say, um, hi, why don't you come and uh, you know come and talk to me? In Arabic you would say something like ta'alba ta'alamu. In other words, you would say something like "come to uncle," right? Uh, 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 come to, and you would refer to yourself to, to yourself as to yourself as uncle in this case. In other words, you sort of step out of yourself, right, in certain ways, so as to um, precisely being able to act in a certain way. Um, and it's, but it's that stepping what you step out into is your identity as a relation, precisely not as an identity, but as an uncle, right? You are a relation, always already, right? Um, yeah. Yep. Just concerning to you, kind of what you were saying, like how to feel and kind of be supportive. I think for me, the most moving part with that video was that the child was not crying right. until he received the hug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just shaking like he was a, just shaking yeah. in shock, yeah. and yeah. then when the uncle stepped up yeah. and gave him a hug, that's when he yeah. fell apart. Like, that's he, when it started. That's to where he begins to cry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think we've all cried as well with them. Um, and I think we recognize the kind of work performed by this nurse, right? Um, it's this work of comforting. It's a work that is typically designated, de designated as women's work, let's say, in a broader context, that what women are socialized to provide, that learn to perform. In, in, in anthropologically speaking, we would call it effective labor, right? Um, and it is precisely the power to be not only affected, but also affect, right, at the same time. It is why, in fact, having that capacity, you are also very powerful. Um, uh, and in that, that is a challenge to the notion of what is power itself in a certain sense, right? What shuts down this capacity, this capacity to be in relation, to make yourself uh, a, 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 a relational vis-a-vis -vis someone else, right, is our socialization as modern citizen subjects, right? The modern socializations. It is uh, the way in which we are, are taught, we grow up uh, 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 in European modernity, and I think in particular also in Swedish modernity, right, to understand, uh, understand ourselves not as relations, but as precisely as independent sovereign selves, right? Little islands upon ourselves, right, in that sense. Um, and that particular way of understanding yourself as an island, as a sovereign self, right, as a not as a relation, right, is linked to a particular mode or style of politics, right? Uh, the politics of what we might call uh, 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 civil society, right? Uh, the sort of the ideal form of of, of modern uh, 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 Republican uh, political uh, 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 participation. And that sort of process entails voting every four years. It entails petitioning the state when you want something changed, like petitioning the Swedish government to call for a ceasefire, for instance, right? It, it always entails following the law, right? That's precisely why it's called civil society. We don't step out of bounds, right? One word by which we might describe this is um, a term that uh, um, the French philosopher Michel, Michel Foucault coined, uh, which is that of governmentality, right? It is a capacity, a way to allow ourselves to be governed and disciplined in certain ways, right? And to me, having worked for a long time in Palestine, in my own understanding, having become Palestinian, this mode of politics has come to seem strange because in Palestine, politics is not, or historically, this is something the, the introduction of, of a Palestinian protestate has changed things, but historically, mm -hmm. politics is not to ask the state to do something. It is not to petition, right? Um, the Palestinian revolution, uh, the revolution, revolution that produced the posters that you saw, right, of, of the, the, the Palestinians struggling in solidarity with, um, uh, with uh, the Irish and the Vietnamese, right? It grew out of, in, out of a reality of a world in which there was no state, right? The world of the Palestinian refugee camp. It was a world in which if you wanted something done, you did it yourselves precisely by not being selves, by not being individuals, by, but by acting collectively and directly. Right? It was a, a matter of undertaking direct action. Uh, and in doing so, you could not let yourself be bound by the law, right? In the sort of manner of civil society, because in the eyes of this law, with its international law, Israeli law, you do not exist as a Palestinian, right? There's literally no place for you in the eyes of the law, right? Um, and I think that if we understand that to various degrees, 
um, there are maybe other peoples like the Palestinians. We all we can also then make. I think I think it's sort of a speculative uh, a, a draw a speculative hypothesis, or sort of an, about why it is that could, that there may be, in a certain sense, something to the colonial understanding of co colonized peoples as excitable, right? Not in the sense of them being angry, emotional, but in the sense of them having a habit of acting directly and collectively rather than waiting for the state to act. Most typically, of course, in protest against the colonial state, right? In the insurrection against the colonial state, right? Not sitting down and following the law, in the refusal to be governmentalized, in other words, right? Because regardless of, of you know, for all their cultural diversity, um, these colonized peoples have yet to be ruled and constituted by modern nation states. They have yet to be governmentalized, right? That is why they have the capacity to both affect and be affected. Um, so my cl in closing, I wanted to um, pull out what would be one of the implications, uh, what we learn from if we think about politics and, and ourselves as being affected. One of the things I think that we learn is that in order to draw people into a struggle, right? In order to to in to let's let's say make people feel, we must also enable them to do something, right? If we try to you know move people by the mere presentation of images, right, they are likely in the long run, right, to suffer this sort of you know uh, a, a growing indifference, right, of which Susan Sontag speaks, right. So we have to in some ways create a feedback loop, right, whereby they can. We can present something to them, but also give them a way of acting, right? So as to allow them to feel more in relation to what's happening, right? Like to create a kind of interactivity. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me, of course, about uh, struck me about about that challenge in Sweden is that uh, the challenge, in certain respect, particularly when you're dealing with, let's say, uh, a middle class uh, sort of Swedish sensibility is that you can't ask them to do too much. You can't ask them to act right out in a sort of a direct sense immediately, right? You have to provide them with some sort of means of doing something in a way that allows them to feel that they're doing something, maybe even something dramatic, but at the same time, does not take them too far out of their comfort zone, initially, comfort zone initially. And one of the things that I, you know, that I've sort of talked about before, and you know, in our conversations as a group, I wanted to return to these pictures. This is uh, Stephanie, who looked so beautiful in her taub on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, this is another picture of, uh, we know who this person is? Lula, uh, populist president, leftist president of Brazil. Um, observe the color of the shirt that he's wearing. Observe the color of the crowd, what they are wearing, right? Um, this is a picture, uh, actually two pictures that a, a very good friend of mine in Ramallah sent me the other day. Um, he just thought it was beautiful and he sent me these pictures on, on Facebook. Um, and I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, and it was interesting primarily because he thought it was beautiful, something it was he, he wanted to send me these images. And of course they are beautiful images in all kinds of ways. They're extraordinarily beautiful images. Um, and what they focus us on, I think, and what, is something that I've been thinking about for a long time in the context of my own research. And that is the way in which clothing, literally fashion, right, uh, is also always in a certain sense an act, right? In a certain sense that you, we understand ourselves in modernity to actually do something. We can call it a kind of a statement where we do something when we dress something, when we wear something, right? In fact, in Sweden, I think perhaps more than many other European countries, um, we are incredibly, let's say, fashion coordinated in terms of matching our subject position to, our, you know, our, what we wear in a certain sense, right? You can tell quite close, often quite, you know, quite easily where someone sits on the social, in the social matrix on the basis of, of not only where they live increasingly, but also what they wear. Yes, sir. No, I just want to point out, those are AI generated though. Yeah. They're, they're not made. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, I think you think you can tell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But no, I mean, I I, I, I don't think this actually happened, but what struck me was that my friend was moved by these images, right? Um this is another image. Um it's it's from the French Revolution. Um, and these are uh these are represent a particular kind of a figure that emerged out of the, uh, the French Revolution, the so-called sans culotte. Uh, they were so named because of the st style of the pants. 
um, and the typical sort of look is these sorts of pants and then a red cap uh, and then sort of uh, and what they are, what the, what what is interesting about them is that they index the manner in which an actual political movement, a sense of moving together, is actually in some sense enabled by a sense of wearing the same thing, right? That we get the sense of moving together by wearing the same thing, right? It's also, if we think of what it means to move together, I would propose that we think of it as in some sense being in a conversation with someone else, as being in a sort of mode, sitting in the same room with them, right? Talking to them, having listening to them and back and forth and that sense. And that's why I think it's 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 actually, if we think about what it is that enables two people of a particular, two strangers to talk to each other, let's say in Sweden, they will talk to each other if they literally are dressed the same, right? That's the condition of possibility in a certain sense, right? But so one of the things that I've sort of wondered about a lot, and it's kind of a question to you, is how one might think about strategically about using thinking with fashion, thinking with clothing, um, about creating a sense uh, of moving with Palestinians. Let's say in Sweden, this is a picture from a uh, this uh, campaign for you know cancer fondant, right, which was entailed selling these little pink bows. Uh, and uh, here you have sort of, you know, what is presented as a kind of a motley uh, rainbow coalition of Swedes. We're all wearing this pink mm -hmm. little band. And of course, this is the most innocuous uh, apolitical issue you could imagine, right? It doesn't really take much mm -hmm. uh, uh, much courage to wear this. It takes no courage at all, in fact. Um, but it begs, you know, I think it, it, I think insofar as we have, you know, been living through this moment, we know already that just to, just to do something like wearing a kafi in public is already to do something and to put something at stake in public in Sweden, right? You get dirty looks on the subway, right? Um, and you may also, but you may also spark conversations, right? And the what's, what's sort of provocative for me, for me to think with is this question of like, what happens if we get enough 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 people to wear perhaps not a kafi, but just something like a Palestinian band, you know, something like that, right? If you start to seeing that around you in, in Stockholm, you know, in a sort of what happens to the sense of where Palestine is in relationship to Sweden, you know? Um, so that's, that, that, that was sort of my, the speculative part of this, of this talk for me. Um, and that's sort of the end of it. And um, what I kind of then wanted to do is, you know, this is sort of my account of how I've been thinking around affect and politics for quite a long time, um, also connecting research in Palestine and, you know, becoming a Palestinian, living in Palestine. Um, but, but I'm also, of course, curious about and what I want to do, and the reason for me sort of having this talk is that I want to think about, you know, how do you understand? Does this in some way or another articulate with how you understand activism or what you have been doing over the past month, right? How do you, what kind of things have worked for you? You know, what are the difficulties that you feel emotionally or otherwise in terms of sustaining intensity, mm -hmm. engaging people and so forth, right? Um, so that was, that's sort of the conversation uh, from me. So I'd open it up to questions.